nanohub.org. Online simulation and more for nanotechnology. Thanks everyone for participating in our hands-on workshop, uh, Machine Learning. Today, I'm excited to introduce my colleague, Elias Pilionis. He's a professor of uh, mechanical engineering here at Purdue. So he's now in uh, Greece. Um, so Elias got his diploma in applied mathematics from um, the National Technology Technical University in Athens in Greece, and then got a PhD also in applied mathematics for, from Cornell, and joined uh, Purdue University in 2014. And so he's a, an applied mathematician by training, but he, he plays a mechanical engineering on TV and at Purdue. And so he's going to tell us about physics in four machine learning. Thanks everyone for participating and Elias, take it away. All right, thank you, Ale, for inviting me and uh, organizing this uh, mini workshop. So the, the way this thing is gonna work today, I'm gonna go over the theory a little bit, what are physics in formal run networks, how exactly does it work, what is the purpose of them? And uh, we're gonna spend about 20 to, to 20 to 30 minutes on that. And then once we're done with the theory, we'll look at the questions, we'll start the NanoHub tool, I will play a little bit with this, and Athava will lead you through that. Probably quite a bit of stuff for 30 minutes. You, you can uh, keep playing with it even after we're done. All right, so let's click. So here's my objective for today. I want to show you how physical information in the form of differential equations can be used to regularize neural networks. And uh, First, I want to make sure we're all up to uh, speed. I'm going to tell you what the neural network is, okay? But I'm going to do it super fast. It basically looks like this. It uh, takes uh, some x's, which we're going to call inputs, and it produces some outputs. And basically, all these links that you see represent a, a transformation from x to y, a function from x to y. And this function is basically a series of affine transformations, which is linear transformations plus some uh, biases, uh, parameterized by some uh, weights and biases, which I'm going to collectively call theta. So the whole thing is basically a function with some parameters theta. Okay. And I'm going to use this notation right here, which you can read. N is a neural network that takes the input x and has some parameters theta. And produce an output y. Okay, uh, so that's what a neural network is. Now, how do we typically train neural networks? Well, it depends on what you want to do with them. So, if you're doing supervised learning, like regression or classification, you do a certain thing. If you're doing unsupervised learning, uh, like dimensionality reduction, for example, you learn how to uh, do uh, density estimation, you do a different thing. We're gonna, I'm gonna show, tell, tell you a little bit about regression uh, because I, I want to I remind you of the classical things you do when you train neural networks, which is you're minimizing the loss function using stochastic gradient descent. So let's go over regression very briefly. In regression, you have a bunch of inputs, the x's you have here, and you have a bunch of outputs, the y's, and your problem is to find the map from x to y, okay? And the way you typically do that, you want to represent this map with a neural network, of course. And the way you do it is by writing down a loss function. Here, this loss function is the sum of square errors, and you want to minimize it. And if you have enough data and not too many parameters, you can minimize this, you're going to get a nice uh, fit to the map from X to Y. Very classic thing. All right. And the final thing I want to remind you is how we actually solve the minimization problem because we're going to use the same algorithm to uh, play with physics and formula networks. And what we do is we, we uh, follow what is known as stochastic gradient descent. So it looks like this. So you update the parameters iterating. You start from some arbitrary, randomly selected parameters and you change them a little bit and you change them uh, 
in the opposite direction of the gradient of the loss. But the gradient of the loss typically when you, because you have lots of data, you estimate it through what is known as the sampling average approximation that where the stochastic part is coming from. So these X's and the Y's are not all your X's and your Y's, but a randomly sampled subset of these is called the BATS. Uh, and these gradients of the loss uh, with respect to the parameters of the neuron theta, it's coming automatically uh, through a package like PyTorch or TensorFlow. So we're using automatic differentiation to take these derivatives. We don't actually code this. And we're going to use PyTorch today to, to take derivatives whenever we need them. And this term right here is called the learning rate. And it has to satisfy certain constraints so that the algorithm actually converges to a local minimum of the loss. The details for that is in Robbins Monroe, uh, 1951, a very, very famous paper, paper on how to select these learning rates. The first will prove that this algorithm converges. It's important to remember that when we are setting this up, we need to know what are the uh, requirements for convergence. Otherwise, it may never converge. All right. So I'm going to start with an illustrated example. I'm going to show you how you can use neural networks and loss functions to solve an ordinary differential equation. And notice that this paper is written in 1997, so it's 24 years old. It's quite, quite old, okay? It was completely ignored for basically 20 years, like no citations whatsoever for 20 years. And then all of a sudden, the whole thing got revived and, and uh, the paper probably has right now thousands of citations all within the last two years. All right, so this is this is something to remember. Your your work may be recognized uh, a lot later. All right, so this is uh, uh, let, let's do it. Let's let me show you how you can use neural networks to solve all these ordinary differential equations. Here's an ordinary differential equation: the derivative of psi is equal to something, uh, and you have some initial conditions: psi at zero is equal to a. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to parameterize the solution psi essentially using a neural network. Now we're going to be a little bit smart about it and we're not going to make psi a neural network. We're going to parameterize psi in a way that automatically satisfies the initial conditions. This is a very common trick in uh, numerical solutions of differential equations, either ordinary or partial. Uh, you basically, it's a special form. If you plug in uh, x equal to zero, you basically get the initial condition. Okay, that's the trick. And now, this term right here is a neural network which has parameters theta, and we have to find the parameters theta so that this equation, the partial differential equation, the, the ordinary differential equation, is satisfied everywhere for all x's. Of course, from x equals zero up to a big number. And uh, we don't have to worry about the initial conditions because of this trick, they are automatically satisfied. Here's the idea. Here's the idea presented in that paper by Lagares in 1997. You take, you, you need to make a loss function to train your network. Okay, so how do you make that loss function? So that minimizing the loss function is equivalent to solving the partial differential, the, the ordinary differential equation. So here's how you do it. You take the differential equation, you move everything to one side, you square it, so you create the square residual of the differential equation, and then you integrate this thing over all the axes. Of course, here we go from zero to one. So now if you minimize this exactly, so if you bring it down to zero, basically, you have found a neural network that solves the ordinary differential equation. That's the idea. All right, how do you solve this problem? Let's say you have an integral, right? You don't have a finite amount of data. So the integral is essentially equivalent to infinite x's. That's what it is equivalent. It's the summation of all the x's, continuous summation. So you can still do, use the idea of batting, 
there are some details here to, here to show that this algorithm, stochastic gradient descent written down like this, actually converges to the minimum or local minimum of the loss function above. We're going to skip these steps. It's pretty straightforward. If you're interested in it, you can take my class. I talk about it there. But this is the algorithm that we would use to minimize the loss function above. Look at these, these X's right here. They're randomly sampled points, randomly sampled X's between zero and one, uniformly sampled. And you can see that if you do it this way and the learning rate is just right, this will converge. And it will converge even if you just take one sample per iteration. So you just pick one X per iteration, it will still converge. Of course, the more samples you take per iteration, the less variance of the algorithm and uh, the faster it will converge in terms of iteration. Okay, so that's pretty much it. So in the hands-on activity, the very first thing we're going to start with is solve this really trivial uh, differential equation of which I have a, an exact solution. So you can compare that doing this thing with your network will actually recover the exact solution. So you're going to do this hands-on activity after I'm done. This is the kind of plot you're going to see. You're going to see basically a perfect match between the uh, true solution to this initial value problem and your approximation with neural networks. Okay. Um, all right. Illustrated example number two. Let's use the same idea to solve partial differential equations. You'd be surprised. There's actually nothing new here. It's the same thing we did before, only with partial differential equations. Here's a standard uh, elliptic partial differential equation that appears everywhere from uh, magnetostatics to elasticity to heat transfer, flow through post media, ubiquitous equation. And uh, we want to solve this with neural networks. So we're going to parameterize U so that it satisfies some uh, various the boundary conditions, let's say. But what you do is you take let's say, the left hand side, you move it to the right, right hand side, you square. The residual and you integrate over space. Okay, or now x is not necessarily one dimensional, it could be two dimensional, three dimensional. Okay, so that's how you make a loss function, the minimization of which is equivalent to solving the PD. Okay, and that's the idea that got that revived Lagarde's paper at the first. New instance of, of this is, is by Resi, but guys and Tanya that is on, on this paper. All right. Now, uh, using the integrated square residual, so moving everything to one side, squaring, integrating is one way to do it. We have shown in our own work is that it's not necessarily the best way to do it because the loss function doesn't necessarily have a unique solution. And in some physical problems, in this part, physical problem in particular, which is analytic per PDE, there's a mathematical theorem called the Dirichlet principle that shows you that solving this PDE is equivalent to minimizing this loss function, which is essentially the energy contained in the U field. And uh, so the mathematical proof says that Minimizing this, this loss function, the energy functional, has a unique solution. And uh, the solution satisfies the PDE. And you see that it is different than the integrated square residual. And it also has this term right here, which is the natural boundary conditions, which didn't even appear in the, in the other uh, formulation. You would have to introduce them by hand. So take home message, whenever there is an energy formulation for your ODE or PDE, that's actually better to use than using the integrated square residual because it usually has a unique solution. It behaves better in general. All right, why is this useful? Why should you care? You already know how to solve ODEs and PDEs. So, on that regard, this is completely useless. Okay. So let me tell you why it's useful and why you should pay attention to it. 
the, the, the reason is not that you can solve a single OD or a single PD. The reason is because you can generalize this technique to solve PDDs for all possible parameters, for all initial conditions, for all boundary conditions in one sweep. And let me demonstrate this through an example from, from our own paper. So here's a PDE, just like we had before, an elliptic PDE. Only now notice this term A here, which you can think of as a thermal conductivity, for example, of a material, is uh, parameterized by xi. And you, you can think of it as random. Right? And you want to solve, the, there's not a single PDE here, there's a PDE for its realization of xi. And you want to solve this PDE for all the xi at once. Now let me give some boundary conditions. Also, I'm gonna we're gonna operate on a box. We have uh, these these the boundary conditions, natural boundary conditions like that. Psi are the random parameters. We want to solve this boundary value problem for all size. And I'll let me so tell you how the the uh, log of a the log of the conductivity would look like. So it could look like this. So it's basically a picture. And it cannot be described with one or two parameters. As a matter of fact, it, you require a few thousand parameters to describe these pictures. And we want to solve the PDE for all such pictures. So we want to be able to, to plug in such a picture, give a neural network a picture, and give it a special location. And it's going to tell us what is the temperature of that location if that was our conductivity. And that you should satisfy, of course, the PDE that we showed you before for all oxide. Okay, that's the problem we want to solve. Uh, and that size of, is basically described by about 1,000 pixels in, in this particular example. Okay, so how do you do that? You use, again, the Dirichlet principle, but in an extended way to get this loss function. So notice that what we have inside is the loss function we had before, but now we have included a, an integral over all the parameters. So what do you do? You basically treat the parameters just like you treat the spatial variables. You integrate over them, and that gives you the loss function. And for this particular loss function, we prove in this paper that if you minimize it, there's a unique solution. If you minimize it, you're solving the PDE for all of that. All right, so if you do stochastic gradient descent for uh, a neural network that represents the solution here, it will convert to the solution of the stochastic price of the It will solve this for all of that. And then you're going to be able to feed it whatever picture you like, and it's going to respond with a prediction here you see the solution with five volumes for this particular xi and here you see the prediction of the network and you can see that you can feed it basically whatever you want and it, it will still provide quite good results now back then when we wrote this paper if you notice carefully you will see that the neural network is missing some of the fine features of the solution Back then, when we wrote this paper, we didn't know about you know how to make make this better. There is a, a, an issue with neural networks in general known as the spectral bias, which came up around the time we published the paper. Now that we know about the spectral bias, we can actually make it much better. Okay, so what are the other applications of all this? To give you a, 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 we talked about high dimensional propagation for PDs. That's one application. And you can imagine that this is just one PD. You can go and do it in another Stokes equation. You can go, go and do the elasticity equation. You can go and do it to Schrodinger equation. Uh, you can go and do it to the okay, As soon as you have a PD with parameters, you can use this technique. To solve the PDE for all parameters, you can solve use you can formulate and solve uh, ill-defined PDE problems like problems with free boundary or the found problems. You can see per the car's paper on that. You can do PDE constraint optimization, 
So there is a paper, a recent paper by NVIDIA. It's not peer reviewed yet, but you can find it and read about it, where they basically uh, design heatsink uh, using this idea. Um, and that, as a matter of fact, last year, the CEO presented this in his keynote speak, in this particular work. Um, you can use the idea to do model calibration. So if you have a PD with parameters and you want to identify the parameters using some data, you can make a loss function. One part of which has your data, the other part has the uh, physics-based part of the loss function. You weight the two things and you minimize the weight of some of them, and this could solve your loss problem. Of course, it will have to be a well-defined loss problem. And uh, you could use this idea to do data simulation, and we have a time-dependent time-dependent measurements, and the underlying field satisfies some time-evolving PDs. You could use data to reconstruct the underlying fields. So these are some, we're working on this with uh, Pavlos Vlakos, um, particle image velocimetry essentially using physics and computer networks. As a matter of fact, Kevin Vlakos also has a paper on this that came out uh, a while ago. And I will go as far as say that at least my community is going to be engaged in this for the next four or five years. As a matter of fact, we don't have yet a next big thing. This is our next big thing. It could be our, the solution to our problems because it's really straightforward to formulate the problem to just need a loss function that you can make out of the physics and then you do stochastic gradient descent. Super simple. The neural networks scale very well with increasing dimensions. And all our methods for uncertainty quantification, for example, suffer from the curse of dimensionality. Deep neural networks suffer less. Um, so I, I, I think we're going to be seeing more and more of this in, in the near future. All right, so what is the CATS? The CATS is that if you try to apply it to your problem, it's not going to work. Okay. And I can, unless your problem is very, very, very simple, it's not going to work. And uh, there are many reasons why it's not going to work. There's a problem of unseen gradients. This is a common problem in neural networks, uh, especially deep neural networks. The gradients, if you make them too deep, they are very close to zero, and the stochastic gradients and don't doesn't move them. So theoretically, it will convert, but in practice, it never converges in a reasonable amount of time. There, are, there is a way to fix this. You can use residual connections. We show you how to do this in the hundred activities. There's a spectral bias of deep neural networks, which is something that uh, we discovered theoretically basically last uh, summer, and this, the, there is. The spectral bias can be described as follows. If you, a neural network first learns low frequencies, it learns smooth things, and it will eventually learn the high frequency uh, content of a function, but it will take forever. So if you have our solving your PD, for example, that has a sharp uh, feature solution, it will find, let's say, the mean, and then it will take forever to convert to, to, the, to the fine details. It will convert to the findings, but it will take forever. And that's coming from the spectral bias. It's theoretically explained why this happens. And there is a way to overcome the spectral bias using some so-called Fourier features at the very beginning of the network. And we'll show you how to do that in the hands-on Um Yes. And uh, that's all I have. All right, uh, so Atharva, uh, you can take it away from here. Um, so this hands-on activity has too many examples. Uh, what I'll do is I'll present an overview of what we are trying to do in these examples. And then maybe everyone can run the code and see how we implement these examples in PyTorch and what are the kind of results that we get. Um, so let's uh, begin with the first example. Um, in the first example, uh, we are trying to solve an ordinary differential equation using neural networks. And this is basically the same example which Professor Bilionis was talking about in, the, in his talk. Here, the main idea is to first represent the solution using, uh, using a uh, neural network. This is what I'm doing over here. 
And then the loss function that we minimize to train the network is the squared residual loss. And we obtain this from the differential equation itself. This is a, a pretty straightforward example. And the main idea behind this example was to show how we can parameterize this solution of the ODE using the neural network and see how we can set up the loss function. Uh, so this example kind of forms the basis of more complex problems that we would like to solve using pins. In the next few cells, I'm just setting up the problem. And uh, you can, once I'm done with an overview of these two examples, you can run this and see the kind of results that we get. Uh, moving on to the uh, second example. Uh, in this example, we go over how we can obtain simulator-free solution using neural networks. Uh, for this, we use an example from a solid mechanics. And in particular, we have a square body, which we subject to specified displacement boundary conditions. And the goal is to find the final orientation of this body in a deformed state. Uh, traditionally, we solve this problem using FEM. Uh, but the issue of using FEM is that it's time consuming for a large value of displacement boundary conditions. And in the notebook, I go over why exactly that's the case. Um, so overall, uh, in this example, uh, I show how we can solve the, this problem using pins. And I also go over how different network structures uh, affect the results. So that's kind of like an overview of what these two examples talk about. Now maybe everyone can run this notebook at their end and see the kind of results that we obtain. And as everyone goes through the activity, uh, Professor Billionis and I can answer any questions that you might have. So in the first cell, I'm just importing the relevant libraries. And in the second cell, I'm first uh, defining uh, our network. And this is basically done using the module nn.sequential. For this particular problem, uh, the initial condition A is equal to zero. And psi t is our trial solution that we had chosen for this particular uh, ordinary differential equation. And as you can see, if we plug x equals to zero, we do get psi of x equals to a, which is our initial condition. So it does satisfy our uh, initial uh, condition. For this particular problem, uh, the right hand side function f of x comma phi is uh, in particular this. It's some exponential um, negative x by five times some cosine minus i by five. And then I'm defining our loss function, which is uh, this term right here. In this particular cell, cell number three, we first define the optimizer that we are trying to uh, use to solve this uh, problem. And then we define a collection of points that we would like to use over which we want to solve this particular problem. Over here, we are choosing a zero to two. And then we define a function uh, which kind of goes over the optimization algorithm for a different number of uh, iterations. And then we essentially, if we run the cell, I need to run everything first. Just a second. Yes, everyone, all participants, you have to, in, in Jupyter, things are sequential, right? So you run the cells from the top to the bottom. Yeah. Okay, so this is the kind of solution that we obtain. Um, the blue line, as you can see, is the true solution. And the dotted line is the approximation using neural networks. And in cell four, uh, we are kind of using, we, we are solving the same problem, but with a different kind of algorithm, which is a stochastic gradient algorithm. So what we are doing is instead of passing a whole bunch of points together, we are choosing a batches of uh, points and we are trying to estimate the parameters. And 
this is the kind of it's the results basically look the same for both cases. So the main idea for this example was to show how we uh, set up the loss function and parameterize the solution using the differential equation. Now I'll go to the second example. So in this example, we have a square body, uh, which is a which is on a defined on a one by one grid. And the boundary conditions on this body are that the body is fixed on the left hand side. So the displacement along X and the Y equals to zero. And we apply a displacement of delta on the right hand side. So UX equals to delta and UY is zero. For this a particular body, uh, the stored energy can be expressed by this integral, which is defined in terms of the displacement field. And the final orientation of this body uh, is going to be described by a displacement field, uh, which minimizes this stored energy in the body. So for this particular problem, uh, the way we parameterize the displacement field ux and ui, which are the x and the y components of the displacement field, are by using two different types of neural networks. And this is how we do it. So if you plug x equals to uh, zero, we get uh, ux equal uh, ux equals to zero, and ui is zero as well. So essentially, these two parameterization do satisfy are boundary conditions. And the loss function that we are minimizing is essentially uh, the, we are trying to minimize this energy and we are trying to find the displacement field which is minimizing this integral. In the next few cells, I am defining the displacement, the helper function which are going to be used for this particular example. Um, in cell six, I'm first defining the displacement function, uh, which takes as input uh, the coordinate x where you want to find the displacement, um, the displace the displacement itself, which is delta, and the two neural networks for the x and the y component of the displacement. Sorry, Thamba, can you zoom a little bit because people have trouble on oh, okay. clicking. I have to be here to do the budget. Can everyone see it now? And it there's a question. Yes, there's a question. Uh, can we create our own Zupta notebook in Amohab, which is not really lonely? Um, so, what I would say is if people are having issues changing values, I also have a link over here at the top of the notebook. Is there a, so a solution within Amohab? Yeah, yeah. Let, let me uh, let me answer this. You, by the way, you should be able to change whatever you want, right, and run it. Yeah. If you want to save it, there's uh, a couple of things you can do. You can re replicate. If you go to file, you can create your own copy of the notebook. Okay. Uh, yeah. You can download it, but you can also rename, save us. You see at the very top. And when you save us, it's going to be your own copy and you will be able to uh, save it. Um, if there's a tool in NanoHub co co called Jupyter and you can upload any notebook directly there and run it. And you have a home directory in NanoHub where you can put your files wherever you want. Um, so, uh, it's true that this notebook is read only when you run it, but it's very easy to make a copy of it and save it or create and move any notebook that you want uh, in Navajo. Okay, can I proceed now? Okay. Um. So here, here I'm defining some helper function um, that I use throughout the activity. UR is our displacement function. Loss is the loss function that we are trying to minimize. And this is essentially uh, this equation right here. And then train multi-field fracture is our training loop. 
um, that we will use to train different networks. Uh, the function model capacity tells us the number of parameters and the number of layers that we have in the in our neural networks. And finally, I have some plot functions to uh, plot the output results. So let's begin with the case where we have a displacement of 0.5. And for this particular case, uh, we begin by a simply, uh, simply connected, fully connected uh, neural network. So these are the two networks that we have. And using the model capacity, we can see the number of layers and the number of model parameters that we have in each one of these networks. And over here, I'm just plotting and seeing how the results look like before training. This is to just make sure that our network kind of follows, uh, satisfies the boundary condition. So as you can see, uh, ux at x, uh, ux and ui at x equals to zero is zero. And in this particular case, we are applying a displacement of 0.5. So the right edge is at 1.5. Similarly, for the vertical displacement UI is zero at the left and the right edges. And in the center, it can be anything right now because we haven't really trained the network. So in the first case, uh, if we train the network for, let's say, 5,000 iteration, and for the batch size, we use a batch size of 10. Um, th this is the kind of uh, loss that we have obtained. So here, the blue line represents how the loss is converging for 5,000 iteration in our case. And the orange line is the energy that we obtain using FEM. So as we can see, uh, for 5,000 iteration, using a simple network, um, the loss doesn't really converge to the true value of the energy. And if we use this network to uh, visualize the results after training, this is uh, what we get. Um, so the issue uh, that we might be having is, uh, first of all, the network that we are using is kind of is deeper than what we use in the first example. Um, so because of which we could be having an issue of vanishing gradients. And the second issue that we could be having is uh, the problem of a spectral bias, which Professor Billion has talked about during his talk. So next, we try a different type of network ar architecture. And in particular, uh, we try a residual uh, architecture, ResNet architecture. In this, uh, we have different uh, residual blocks in the network. And the main idea is we are introducing skip connections within the layers. So what happens is the input comes through the first layer and it pass, passes through this residual block. And this is, a, this is what the residual block looks like on the right-hand side. So as the input comes through the residual block, it not only passes through the different layers inside the block, but also uh, we have a, a skip connection from the input directly to the output. So that's the main idea, just introduce uh, skip connections in the network. So over here, I'm defining a ResNet class, uh, which we'll use to create a network. And here's a simple uh, network, DenseNet1 and DenseNet2. And as you can see, uh, we have the same number of layers and the same number of model parameters as we did in part A, then we had a simple, simply connected uh, neural network. And again, uh, I'm plotting the uh, orientation of the body before training the net uh, networks. And once we uh, train using this ResNet architecture, this is what the R loss function looks like. So as we can see, the loss function did improve a little bit for 5,000 iterations. Uh, but we, it still hasn't converged to uh, the FVM energy. I'm sure that it, it's going to converge if we run it for, let's say, 20,000 iterations. Uh, but there's an, uh, another way in which we can expedite this uh, convergence process. 
And for that, uh, we go to part three of the example. So in this uh, particular part, uh, we introduced a Fourier feature mapping. So what the Fourier feature mapping does is it basically introduces, uh, it basically passes the inputs through a Fourier mapping, and it helps uh, the our model learn the high frequency features in a better way. Uh, you can uh, learn more about the read more about this Fourier features in this particular paper. So this is how our uh, the orientation of uh, the body looks like before training. And once we train uh, this network using the Fourier feature, uh, which is the green plot, uh, we can see the results converge to the FVM value uh, uh, fairly uh, quickly. And these are the kind of uh, results that we get. And uh, when we compare this to the actual uh, results that we obtain uh, using FVM, uh, we uh, get pretty, uh, the results are pretty uh, close to the actual, the true results. So here are a few questions. Uh, when you run it at your end, you can try different things uh, and maybe if you get better results. Mm, that's basically it. Excellent, Atharva. So uh, let me thank uh, Atharva and Elias for a great uh, workshop and a great presentation. Very nicely done. And maybe we can take some uh, Q&A, answer some questions outside of the Q&A. Maybe Elias, you want to take over some of the, and answer uh, some of the questions that maybe were more uh, critical. Yes, so let me see what I've answered so far. So can the energy approach we used to uh, create a loss function for all PDEs? It's a very good question. The answer is uh, no, you have to have an energy function. But if your problem is a physical problem and your PDE is coming from physics, it's very likely that there is an energy principle that you can use. For example, straight gear equation, if you're looking for ground state uh, wave function, there is an energy principle, of course, that the ground state minimizes the energy, right? Uh, if, you, if you are in a time-dependent setting where there is no energy principle, there is a principle of least action or stationary action. So you could use the action functional as your loss function. As far as I know, nobody has done that. There's, uh, there's been lots of low hanging fruit, so people haven't gone into that yet. But the uh, action is the special temporal integral of, of a Lagrangian. Uh, so if you have a Lagrangian for your system, you, you can make your loss function out of that. Uh, now, if you have uh, energy dissipation in your system, if you're losing energy, then there is no action for your system that is being minimized, you're going to have to expand your system to say where your, the energy is going in order to write down uh, a principle of this action. Um, let's see what other question I have here. My course is ME539 Production Scientific Computing. And I'm going to gradually, right now I have three lectures on neural networks and this stuff. Now I'm going to make this part of the class bigger and bigger as the years pass. Um, so there has been questions. Yes. I was going to say one of the questions is what happens when there's multiple local optima? Yeah. You are screwed. That's what happens. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. If you try to use this, Naively in your problem because we're still at the beginning, as we don't understand everything, uh, how to use this technique. You're going to get into one of them. Okay. Now, if you're doing stochastic gradient descent, there are some theorems that show that stochastic gradient descent will actually jump over bad local minima. Okay. So that's why you should always 
you have some stochasticity in, 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 in the way you minimize the problem. And if you want to learn more about that, you should go and read Michael Jordan's Stanford um, uh, professor uh, on, on this topic and the convergence of stochastic gradient descent. Uh, the other thing is that if you have an energy principle, then it is very likely that you have a single local, uh, a single uh, minimum. And that's why you should, instead of the like, degrees of current residual, use the local minimum, the uh, energy function, if you have. Uh, other question is so I want to mention a little bit about data, right? So, what we did in this hands on activity has no data. We just directly use the physics to solve the PDE or the ODE. And you could extend this to solving the ODE or the PDE for many different parameters in one suite, for all parameters in one suite. Now, if you have data, so let's say that you have a Tharva's uh, problem with the neo hookian material, and you also have some uh, uh, strain measurements, okay? You could use these data to augment your, so you could essentially use both the data and the physics. How do you do that? You have a, a data part for the loss function, which is basically the sum of square errors, sum of uh, the squares of the errors of your predictions. That's one part of the loss function. And then to add to that, you add the uh, physics-based loss function. So you combine the two. And then you minimize that. And then you get the basically the ability to extrapolate beyond the limited data you have to the entire domain because you're using the physics to pass any holes you may have. Um, and then if in your physics you have missing parameters, you can also add these in your optimization problem and then have a, a nice data uh, assimilation and calibration problem. Maybe one more question, Elias, before we run out of time. Yes, I'm trying to get to the, the end where you have data, but you either don't know the guiding physics or have an approximate knowledge of it. You have that's the basic research question that is on the mind of pretty much everyone right now. So the idea would be to parameterize the physics somehow. So for example, one idea would be to say, I don't know the right-hand side of my differential equation. I'm going to make it a neural network and I'm going to try to fit it as well. As so you have data, you know that there should be some differential equation. You don't know exactly it's for, you parameterize it and you create now a loss function that has the physics with a parameterized OD and the data and minimize that. And hopefully that will recover the physics. There is, uh, it's a very hot topic. How do you learn physics? You can, Say we're gonna, I'm going to learn the Lagrangian, for example. Again, no one has done that with satisfactory degrees. I cannot give you any uh, references, but if you go to conferences on such qualification or computation science and engineering, there will be at least two or three minutes of course on just that. Uh, how can we extend this to density functional theory? You could, in principle, use this to. So you, 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 you will have to go to the energy principle, right? So you need the minimization. You, you, if you can pose the problem of finding the energy density as a minimization problem, in principle, you could use this technique. Will it work better than uh, density functional theory? Um, has somebody done it? If, if it's not already done, because there are about 200 papers per week on the topic, uh, somebody will do it with a try. I don't know if it's going to work within the next month, months. How do you infer physics? Same question like before, open problem. Uh, what if you have data? I, I think I covered all the questions for audience. Would L1 loss post slide? We will post the slides. L1 loss functions help the network ignore noisier chaotic features in the physical models. Good. Uh, point, I do not know. Uh, not, uh, in my knowledge, nobody has done it. What is the advantage 
of using the pins over generating training data and training the MSC loss. Very good question. Here's the advantage. You don't need a solver for your physical problem. Okay. Uh, that's one advantage. And in high dimensional param par parameter spaces, the problem of generating training data and minimizing the MSC loss doesn't scale. You need so much data that's impossible. Um, so it's the curse of dimensionality. It is written that Monte Carlo is used for the integral. What does this actually mean? Does this have any significance to the final accuracy? So Monte Carlo is used, something others are used to drive the optimization process. And the theorem, Robinson Monroe theorem, says that no matter how much uncertainty you have in this estimate, if you run enough iterations, it will recover. It will go to a local mean of a lot. That's what the theorem says. However, if you're using very few samples, you're jumping around a lot, and it takes a while to to get to uh, to the uh, to, to to the minimum. If you are using too many samples, you may get trapped by a local minimum. Uh, if your variance is not big, so you need there's a sweet spot on this uncertainty. There's just you know you have to experiment to find it. That's why I'm telling you that if you just try it. It's not going to work because of these levels that you have to pick just right. But we don't know uh, how to guide you yet. All right. Thanks for all those answers, Elias. Thanks again for uh, a great presentation, both Elias and Natharva.